You're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. Thank you so much for joining me. We really appreciate you being here with us. Before we start, we always like to thank all the members of Wall Plus. They're the reason that the show and the network exist. And you can learn about all the great benefits of subscribing to our Patreon at joinwallplus.com. You'll get all kinds of bonus content, access to the complete archives of the show, ad-free episodes, and you'll be supporting common sense, nice libertarianism. And isn't that what the world needs? Thank you especially to our $100 a month members, John Pasillo, Vincent Peichel, Lars Nordskog, Jake Dell, Matthew Durbin, Reinhold, Christy Avery, and Jason Doolittle. We also want to thank our main sponsor, Iconic Insurance. And it's hard to find good insurance, especially if you're self-employed. And my buddy Matt Allen over at Iconic Insurance does a great job. He doesn't he doesn't want to make money. He just wants to help you get good insurance. So check him out at iconic-insurance.com slash libertarians. Well, today we are talking about educational choice. Uh, education choice, I don't know how you say it. I'll ask the expert that we're talking to. A uh, long time, uh, important subject to me. And I am glad to welcome Cooper Conway who is a National Voice Fellow at 50 Can and a contributor at Young Voices, where he focuses on education reform. And we're going to be talking about Carson v. Mankin, the latest school choice case heard at the Supreme Court in the United States. Cooper Conway, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you being here. Well, Chris, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, it is always nice to talk to you young kids that make me feel old. And the pre-interview is, is uh, you, you know, you're just where I was 20 years ago, just bright eyed, bushy tailed. Uh, it's, it's nice to see. I appreciate your energy. Uh, and how did you get into commentary? Tell us a little bit about yourself before we start talking. about. Yeah, education. well, yeah, well, I started with education choice, um, really being able to experience uh, education freedom myself. Um, my parents had the opportunity to move into a nicer neighborhood with a nicer public school growing up. So we did that right away. Um, and then my dad is also a teacher. So he started teaching at a private school where I was able to receive a scholarship um, and have access to a great private Christian education um, growing up from second grade through um, graduating high school. And I think it's one of the reasons I was able to uh, graduate college recently. And I, um, I'm headed to grad school as well um, to Pepperdine. And I attribute a lot of uh, my success to that opportunity and educational freedom. And I just want every child to be able to experience uh, educational freedom now. How did, uh, how did you come about, how did your libertarianism form? Were you born into it? It's, it's weird to start talking to people who are born into libertarianism because their parents heard about it from Ron Paul. But, you know, how did you end up a free market guy? Well, I really did not start off as a free market guy at all. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier before the show started, I'm from uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, free markets no. is not exactly something that we uh, we champion out here. Um, but in between my freshman and sophomore years of college, I went to go work at a small um, nonprofit in um, inner city Baltimore. And I realized that a lot of the problems that these people were facing um, were because of the government and not having um, opportunity. And after that, I ended up interning at the Heritage Foundation and kind of a weird story. Um, and then I did a lot of um, the beginning of my work in educational freedom at uh, the Cascade Policy Institute um, in Portland, Oregon, which is a free market think tank at the beginning of COVID um, when schools were shutting down. And this was when um, Oregon's governor stepped in um, and said that, well, we're not going to have any public schools be open. And so a bunch of families went to go move to online charter schools that already had the infrastructure in place to be able to teach their students. And then the governor stepped in and said, well, we're not, we're going to have a cap at that too. So um, parents were really just stuck without any um, great educational opportunities for their children while public schools were scrambling um, to set up something or anything to help these um, families. And it just took a lot longer um, than it should have while teachers unions really just dominated the political landscape um, and blocked educational freedom from happening in Oregon. Well, everywhere. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. think about teachers unions trying to keep schools shut down in places like Chicago and the black eye that they got for that. And even the most bluest of states and cities. Uh, I've said for, for the 10 years that I've done this show, the internet has revolutionized every industry with the exception of government and education. And the pandemic was really the reckoning for those two two industries. And you see the declining 
rates of enrollment happening across the country at schools as people start to kind of walk away and maybe do something a little bit different. Uh, and one of, I mean, education choice is not new. Milton Friedman, obviously. We have the Friedman Foundation here in Indianapolis, and we're big fans of them over there. Mm -hmm. uh, his book, Free to Choose, is a foundational document on uh, educational choice. Uh, but it still continues to be contentious, even when you look at cities like Indianapolis that have a thriving, thriving private and public and charter school environment, lots of educational choice here. Teachers unions still continue to fight it, and it ended up in the Supreme Court with Carson v. Mankin. Can you talk a little bit about Carson v. Mankin, this Supreme Court case that was just decided? Yeah, so Carson v. Mankin was a, um, a case that came out of Maine. And so um, for those who don't know this, Maine is actually the most rural state in the country based off of its population. Uh, you'd think it'd be Alaska, but a lot of Alaska's population is in Anchorage, uh, while Maine's is kind of spread out throughout the state. And so what this means is that a lot of the local school districts in Maine don't have the population um, needed to support an elementary or a middle or, um, or a high school. And so Maine's had a long standing town tuitioning program that would allow parents to be able to take um, the taxpayer dollars meant to be used for their child's education and use them, allow them to use it at other public schools or private schools as well. And then in 1980, Maine's attorney general kind of stepped in and said, well, you can use it at private um, religious schools, but they just can't be any sort of religious use, um, whatever that means. In terms of um, a religious school not being able to uh, teach the religion seems like something that's not going to be um, very popular. And um, these parents kind of stepped up and said, this doesn't make any sense at all. I'm the one making the choice of where I want my child to be able to go to the school. And the Supreme Court affirmed this um, in a six to three vote. Um, and they backed up their previous ruling in Espinosa as well basically saying that if you're going to have a private school choice program, these parents need to be able to access any private school, um, whether it's a religious private school or not. Yeah. So, I mean, was it simply just that people didn't want public money going to private schools? Yeah, it's that's pretty much the case um, all across uh, the country here, as we mentioned with the teachers unions, is that they don't want um, this taxpayer dollars to be able to leave um, this monopoly that is the government education system um, because there's not unionized teachers at these private schools um, and then parents have more access to see, well, maybe the public traditional public school system isn't the school that's best serving my child. <laughs> yeah, I... <laughs> Um, the, and this has kind of been a long standing fight. Uh, you know, we don't want if you take public money, then you can't do certain things. But I feel like we're at a point in the culture war, Con uh, Cooper, excuse me, Cooper Conway is my guest, um, w where it, it sort of like used to feel like there was secular and then there was religious. And now it feels like left versus right schools almost it's there's been a shift i think especially in the last five years where it, it people are sort of starting to sort themselves into well i want my school to be very pro lgbt and i want my school to be you know pro catholic like culture seems to be like seeping into this a lot more are you seeing that in the education reform discussion yeah, without a doubt. Um, parents over the past um, year and a half, two and a half years of, of, of the pandemic have seen really for the first time. It's, it, it almost appears that like, oh, some of the stuff that my um, children are being exposed to, I don't really want them exposed to that. Um, or there's certain beliefs that they just don't agree with, um, whether it's from the left or the right. And really what should be happening here is school choice should be used as the solution. Um, and having parents be able to say, well, I want them to be able to go to my private religious Catholic school, or there's other private schools that are, are more um, LGBTQ affirming, um, for example. And so it really kind of eases the tensions in the education sector um, throughout the country um, and, and, and plenty of these schools, because there, there's tons of different private school options that are available. Um, and there's just new options that are being made available each and every day um, for whatever educational environment works best for the student instead of kind of this one size fits all approach that we've been going with for the past few decades. I mean, you don't have to answer this because I know you're coming at it from more of a journalistic standpoint, but I don't, I don't know. I'm asking more of the listener. Maybe like, I don't, I just don't know how healthy that is for society. I mean, 
part of the benefit of public schooling over the last 150 years is the, the, the mixing and integration of all these different cultures and uh, a better awareness. And I wonder, you know, if giving up on that liberal, classically liberal, uh, you know, multicultural viewpoint is, is healthy and where we, you know, I mean, Cooper, if we start sorting ourselves into these ideological schools, well, we've got Harvard over here and, and conservatives have done this for a long time. Like we've got Hillsdale because, well, they kicked us out of Harvard. We got to make Hillsdale. They kicked <laughs> us out of the New York Times. So we've got to have the National Review. Um, but I don't know that we're better off for some of that. So do you do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I would I would be happy to comment on that. I don't think that's necessarily and hopefully that will never be the case um, where it's really just everyone's siloed off into their own um, certain ideological beliefs. Um, for example, I, as I mentioned, I went to the, the private Christian school um, in my neighborhood uh, or that was close to my neighborhood. This private Christian school accepted people of all different faiths. I know we had um, kids that were Mormon, kids that were more secular or agnostic and atheist. Um, and we were able to still be kind of exposed to not just the Christian values that the school um, did um, and have influenced in their curriculum. Um, but I think that is kind of a larger question at hand here is how are we going to moving forward um, create a country that is understanding um, and that is able to accept everyone's values? And I think school choice is one area where we can say, hey, I can understand that a parent wants their child um, to be educated in this way. I just would prefer for my child to be educated in this way as well. Um, and we can be tolerant of that. This seems to be a newer discussion because 10 years ago it was, well, these schools are failing. And, you know, Manual High School is an inner city school here. And the first two weeks of the school, they have buses rounding kids up because their funding is determined on how many enrollments they have in the first two weeks. And then they kind of give up on truancy after that but nobody really wanted to send their kid to a, a school like manual because it was 30 percent of the kids were actually graduating um that uh, is that more still more the emphasis in the education reform movement or is it more of these cultural conversations mm, that's a great question um honestly i would say it depends who you're talking to and there is more cultural conversations that are being brought up um, however, the failing the failing public schools is something that I think that needs to still continue to be focused on is that we are not defunding public education um, funds from 2002 to uh, 2019 have increased by nearly three thousand um, dollars per child. It's just that these funds aren't actually ever reaching the student um, and education savings accounts, um, say the one that we saw in Arizona, which was um, universally expanded so that every student has access to their taxpayer education dollars to be used. Um, however they see fit, um, can really be used as a way to, um, instead of subsidizing kind of this broken system, um, subsidize the, uh, the student um, and the parents who know their student better than any, anybody else. Um, and that has sh been shown to increase test scores um, for students that are able to access private educational choice programs, but also it has also improved um, public school students who stay in these public schools after the private school choice programs are implemented. Uh, because as we know, competition uh, makes people more efficient and want to step up their game. And these public schools for the first time now have somebody that's competing for their dollars that used to just flow to them no matter what. Yeah, the scare tactics are always teachers, you're going to miss out. And then in Indiana, anytime there's any kind of school choice legislation, there's an army of teachers protesting. Teachers seem to be really touchy because they get uh, you know, worked up by the, the teachers unions. But what would you say to a teacher about the benefits of the of education choice and specifically and maybe we should define, you know, the what is it, the ESA, the education savings account and how the money follows the student you know, how that benefits students and, and teachers? I mean, yeah, I'll start with the education savings account. Um, so in, uh, so uh, your your listeners may be familiar with a voucher. A voucher is really just taking. Um, the lump sum of money that's being used for the per, for the student in the public um, schools and allowing the parents to have access to that to be able to pay for a seat in a private school, which is a great um, educational choice option. Education savings account kind of expands that, makes it more flexible um, and personalizes it to the students to where they can still use it at a private school, but they can also use it for, say, um, special needs therapies, um, if they homeschooled um, online classes or curriculum. 
um, a bunch of different private educational options um, that really uh, puts the student first. Now, how this helps the teacher is we've had these major increases in spending in our K through 12 system, uh, but teachers are right. Their salaries have not actually gone up um, from 1992 to uh, 2016. We spent um, an increase of 27 percent in our public education system, but teacher salaries got knocked down 2 percent. Instead, we're spending the money on um, different administrative salaries um, or other employees that are not actually teachers. So if we have more students being able to use, say, in Arizona, where they had about $7,000 a piece for these education savings accounts, say you have 10 students, um, you have $70,000 going into this micro school or this learning pod, these teachers are now empowered. Uh, there's no middleman, right? The teachers are able to access those funds themselves um, and able to give themselves a better salary um, and a less um, waste of money on other um, education expenses that don't actually affect what's being taught in the classroom um, and the students that are being affected by it. So you don't actually want to ruin public schools. You don't actually want to destroy public schools and make children dumber. No, uh, completely not uh, the case at all. In fact, I don't my, know. That's what I heard on the internet. TikTok yeah, says so. That's, that is what TikTok says. However, educational choice should not ever be a threat to public schools the way that it's set up right now. If the public schools are doing a good enough job um, for students and their families. If the student and family feels like, oh, this public school um, works for me, they're not going to leave, right? They're never going to want to leave. It wouldn't make sense for them to do so. However, if they say, this public school isn't exactly fitting my needs, I need something else, um, then the public school is going to lose some of that, those funds and the student is going to be empowered to leave that school. Um, and luckily, because this is now, a, a, the, now the case, these public schools are uh, performing at higher levels. Um, to try and compete to keep these students. All right. So tell me about what is happening in Michigan uh, yes. specifically. Let's kind of take this broader conversation and, and apply it to the state of Michigan and zero in on what, what is being discussed there. I, I first read your article in the Detroit Times, was it? Uh, Detroit uh, News. Detroit News. Detroit but News. Yes. Michigan's um, very interesting. As we mentioned in the Carson B. Macon case, um, a lot of the anti um, school choice kind of propaganda is going out. We're funding um, religious schools. And so many states um, have these provisions that says any public dollars cannot be used at any private religious school. And the Supreme Court has repeatedly struck this down, um, said that's uh, not constitutional at all because um, it's not. And then but Michigan has a certain provision in their constitution that says, well, not only do we not allow any private religious schools to receive funds, we're not going to let any private schools at all. And so um, families in Michigan where private where school choice is already extremely popular. So uh, public school choice in Michigan, they have open enrollment. So access to other as many public schools as possible. And then there's um, quite a few charter schools. So there is school choice to a certain extent, but there's no private school choice. So families are now saying, well, I want to be able to have access to a private school using my taxpayer education dollars that my children is receiving in their public school. And it's just not legal. And so um, this has become kind of a, a constant battle between the legislature and then um, the governor has vetoed multiple private school choice bills. And I think that Michigan is going to be at the forefront of um, trying to break through um, for private educational choice for families moving forward. Well, uh, is there anything I'm missing that I should ask you before we move on to shameless self-promotion here? Like, uh, th should I ask you a question that I don't know about the, the topic? I'm not totally up on the educational choice movement like I used to be. What are some other exciting pieces of innovation that you look at and you go, wow, people really need to know about this? I think some of I think for me, the most exciting part of the educational choice movement right now uh, is really is, is what I call the silver lining of this pandemic is that for a long time students who were put into a position where they're in a bad education set and a bad education environment um, where lower income families and kind of these consistently failing city um, urban schools um, that have not only failed them but have failed their parents and their parents parents for for generations right but with COVID-19 wealthier families who are able to access um, public schools that are performed um, historically better were now affected and parents realize, well, maybe the public school isn't going to be serving my children, my child the best, um, and that there's other options out there. And so now there's really kind of this um, totality of parents who are saying, well, I want educational choice, um, no matter if I have access to the best public schools or the worst public schools. 
and you're seeing a lot of different parent groups step step into the fight. And so while I could write, I mean, I could pump out an article a day, two articles a day. That's not going to make as much of an impact as five, you know, ticked off moms is what I like to say, who are really trying to fight for their child and have uh, more skin in the game than I do. And so that I think is exciting. And that's something where I think um, the parent voting block is going to become um, more important as time goes on. You already saw in Virginia with Governor Glenn Youngkin, um, his election was swayed largely because of parents. And you're seeing state legislators in Idaho and Iowa um, and Arizona really winning based off of the fact that they're campaigning as a pro school choice candidate. And I think that's something that's going to be um, growing even more as uh, the years go on. All right, Cooper Conway, tell people where they can follow you and uh, what will they see when they get there? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Cooper Conway one. Usually I tweet out my latest articles. Um, that's why I try and stick to. And then you can also see me on the young voices website with my headshot to see all of uh, my different articles and media hits um, to learn more about school choice. So thank you. All right. Thanks for being here. Connor, uh, Connor Cooper, Cooper Conway. I'm, you're going to listen just next time you come on, change your name. All <laughs> right. Thanks for being here. Thank you listeners for joining us. Make sure you go and share this episode. If you learned something, if you found it interesting, you've got a teacher in your life that's terrified of change. Please share that with them and let them know that we really do care about teachers. We care about students. Those of us who believe in education choice, uh, we're just trying to help you get more money and get more job opportunities at the end of the day. So please share with your friends. If you learned something, it's the best way to support the program and we will see you again soon.